All right, hello everyone. Um, welcome to another session of the Friday Transportation Seminar. Um, I'm Dr. Jenny Liu from the School of Urban Studies and Planning, and I host the seminar with Dr. Fucliosi over at Engineering. And today we're very happy to welcome Anne Kirkham here to talk about her um, advocacy in Germany. So um, I'm gonna turn the floor over to her and um, it'll be a very exciting talk today, I think. Great. So testing, let's see if I can get this on. Okay, I hope that works. Seems to work. Hi, thanks for coming. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today as well. My name is Ann Kirkham. Um, I'm actually a native Californian, longtime cyclist. Um, started riding my bike every day for transportation in 1994 and discovered not only was it environmentally sustainable and inexpensive, but it was actually fun. Um, I was involved in some of the early critical masses in San Francisco. I was a bike activist in Seattle and New York City, and I decided to leave the country. Um, I moved to Bremen, Germany, which is a bike city. As you'll see, we have some bike infrastructure, um, but maybe not enough. And then I became a mom, and I realized something needed to happen. Something needed to change. I also have a master's degree in theories of environmental justice and d democratic participation from the New School in New York. So um, that aspect is starting to come into it for me. And eventually, hopefully in the next month or so, I'll be accepted as a doctoral candidate at the TU Berlin in integrated transportation planning. I'm not officially, but I'm on my way to becoming a doctoral candidate and researching this. But I'm presenting to you as an activist, as a neighborhood activist, as an organizer, as a cyclist, and as a mom today. So Bremen is a beautiful city. Um, this is a really typical example. This is our hip neighborhood. This is our, where you go out to go to the club's neighborhood. And you can see all the different modes of transportation going on here. We have trams, we have delivery vehicles, we have lots and lots and lots of cars, including lots of parked cars. I'll get to that in a moment. But no consistent planning. Bremen was one of the first German cities 20 years ago to implement separated bike paths. We do have separated bike paths. Here's one here. This street, however, is lacking them. And this street is a major thoroughfare towards downtown. No space for bikes at all. So you're, what do we call them, middle-aged men in Lycra can slalom over these tram tracks, but somebody using a trike for stability, a kid learning how to ride, ride a bike, um, someone who's not so secure on two wheels, feels intimidated by this kind of a setup. Where are the bikes? We're apparently a bike city. We have a lot of bicycle trips per capita. This is a premium bicycle route. This is my way to, into town. Weather such as we're having at the moment, snow, ice, tram tracks. Anyone who bikes as much as I do in weather like we have here in the Northern Hemisphere, you can look at this and you could say, where, where would I ride? Where are the bikes? No continuous bike lanes. So our premium bike route leads you to this major transit hub, which is right beyond here trams and buses crisscrossing, tracks crisscrossing, and you're just sort of dumped out into our historic downtown. Our town hall here is a UN heritage site from, I wanna say 1400. Our statue of Roland here representing freedom is also UN cultural heritage. Here's the government where they meet nowadays. But again, no space for bikes. What happens is transit trips are increasing. Transit is actually overloaded, but potential cyclists, people who might not feel comfortable bicycling end up taking transit or getting frustrated with over full trams and end up driving even for short distances. So bike trips are not increasing. They've stayed stable for the past 10 years. Why is that? It's a problem, but infrastructure is a problem. This was us trying to photograph bicycle, uh, one of the few roundabouts in Bremen, another premium route here. Um, I think the cars were stopping and letting the cyclist pass, but she has to always look. This cyclist has to always pay attention because bicyclists don't have the right of way in Germany. Pedestrians don't have the right of way. Vehicle code allows whoever's on the right, whoever has yielding right to have the right of way. And the moment that something happens, the moment that um, there's a crash, there's a construction site. This past year, we've had a lot of World War II bombs being found in a certain neighborhood in our town. And you see this kind of traffic just backed up throughout the entire city. Um, I'll get to more of that in a minute. Emissions. Germany has a problem with emissions. 
And so I'm cycling across this bridge, actually going right to the transit hub that I showed you before, right to the historic downtown. This is my way to work, breathing all this in. Germans uh, were sold diesels. People were told that diesels are more efficient. The diesel engines are better. They're more environmentally sustainable. Well, we all now know with so-called diesel gate, what that really means. I hope everybody's familiar. If you're not, I can talk about it a little bit more at the end because there's some current stuff unfolding. So emissions are not reducing. Emissions are staying steady and 25% of our emissions are from motor vehicles. Germany is facing sanctions from the European Union. We're facing a ban on diesel engines in our city centers. I'm not sure this is playing out really current events right now, actual current events in the news. Um, too many private motor vehicles. Not only have people been sold diesels, but just like here in the States, people are being sold SUVs. Our streets are narrower. Our city is about the same size as Portland, but much, much, much denser. I think we have 4,700 people per square mile. Dense, vibrant, multicultural, multi-generational, yet drowning in traffic. To show you a little bit of what we're up against, I'm gonna show you a video. It's in German, but I'll, it's only two minutes, I'll briefly explain the images speak for themselves and I'll explain what some of the bike activists are talking about here. Um, we're a city, we're a river city, like Portland. We have a river, my town, my side is on one side, the old town is on the other side. We have about six bridges over the river, the River Visa. And of those six bridges, four are falling apart. So, Decision makers have chosen to block a lane, but they're not blocking a lane for motorized traffic. They're not blocking a lane for semis. I'll show you what they did here. And again, I'll explain as we go along here, but the pictures speak more than words. This is a short news video. So there's the bridge. 94,000 vehicles a day. 10% of these are semis. You get, get an idea of what it looks like. 10% of them, large, heavy vehicles. So they're gonna to try to get more life out of it. Reduce traffic, right? So what can you do? Reduce the truck traffic. Makes sense. The trucks are heavy. No. They chose to do something else. So these are a couple of our bike club activists. ADFC is like League of American Bic Bicyclists, of which I'm a member and an activist. <laughs> Never want to block a lane of traffic. This is what they've done. So narrow the bike and pedestrian lane by about seven feet because the bicyclists and the pedestrians are obviously the problem. This is serious. This, I could not make this up. This is what we're up against. So what is the difference? It's narrower, it's a little bit more dangerous. They've blocked both sides of the bike and pedestrian path here. This is great and I'll explain it. So they've calculated that this fencing has reduced the weight of the bridge by 234 metric tons, 257 US tons. I'll show you how they did the math. Yeah, exactly. It's too crazy to be believed. Big fat bicyclists. About 3,000 people would have to be biking and walking here. So this fence, right? 
Zahl ist, wenn wir 16 Kilo, die Betonfüße 31 Kilo, also zwei Füße, ein Zaun, das ist schon wieder ein Packfahrer. So, two cement supports plus this one fencing unit is about as heavy as any one of us on a bicycle, us plus our bike. The bridge is heavier with the fencing, isn't it? So, although it's eight tons heavier, it's 234 tons lighter. Official statistics. I don't really get it. He's very diplomatic. Uh, right. nice, nice guy. So the bike plus the, plus the human being plus the fence is lighter than a bike plus a human being. This is real. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Oops. So, mm, mm, mm. this is the kind of bureaucratic hurdle. I mean, you have to see it to believe it. I've watched this so many times now and I still don't believe it. Um, this is the kind of behavior on behalf of decision makers, on behalf of planners that we're up against in Bremen. Um, so according to this official statistics, this bridge is now 234 tons lighter. My husband's a math teacher. <laughs> he didn't get it either. So we started off right in my neighborhood, right around the corner from my house. We looked at parking and I was telling this to my family and they were saying, well, why parking? What's the big deal about parking? There is no parking management outside the city center in Bremen. None whatsoever. And when I became a mom, I didn't really realize people park on the sidewalk, as you can see here, this, this picture on the left. I'll talk about that on, on the right, excuse me. I'll talk about that in a moment. People park on the sidewalk, and I thought it was just a thing that Germans do. But when you have a baby carriage, or you're someone using a wheelchair, using a walker, or you're just two people who want to hold hands walking down the street, German vehicle code says that the sidewalk must be two meters, a little bit more than six foot six wide. They're not, and a garbage day, as you can see with his dad here, the picture on the right, they're not. He has his baby in the bike trailer that he's using as a stroller. He has this other kid in his arms. He can't get through there. So we have permanent, regular resident and visitor. I can tell by the license plate, this is a visitor vehicle, people parking on the sidewalk. Two wheels on the sidewalk, because otherwise the road would be too narrow for emergency vehicles. The road would be too narrow for garbage trucks. And everyone does it because everyone else does it, but it's not enforced in any way, shape, or form. The other type of illegal parking is this, I'll just be a minute. Obviously, this is a delivery vehicle. Um, there are some other ways to deal with deliveries. I don't know if anyone knows about the city of Ghent in Belgium. They've banned all commercial deliveries during business hours with emissions vehicles. So they have things like an electric, like a cargo um, Segway. Electric bikes, cargo bikes, cargo segways. Really nice video. I can point you guys to it if you'd like to see it. Um, showing what Ghent has done. Because there's just enough, not enough room for this kind of delivery traffic. And of course, everyone's ordering things online. So there's more of it all the time. So when we started becoming aware, when we had a kid, that we couldn't push her down the street, we had to go out onto the street. Okay, you've got your kid in your stroller. At least she's strapped down. You can see with this dad, at least his baby is safe if a vehicle comes barreling down um, the street here. But street parking is free. It's absolutely free. And in fact, people from out of town, like this vehicle here, license plates are coded by the county or the town they're registered in. They'll come and they'll park their vehicles in our neighborhood, take the tram to the, tra to the airport, enjoy vacation in the sunshine while their car sits in front of other people's homes. Too many vehicles, too many motorized vehicles in a small, narrow, urban space. The city was not designed for this. Bremen dates back to 856. You know, they didn't have minis back then. And the delivery vehicles are a real problem. So this is a thing that we are trying to get elected officials, parties, decision makers to actually do something about. And a bunch of... Um, Environment and Transportation Organizations has, has issued a statement saying there needs to be parking management. There needs to be some sort of resident parking, visitor parking, loading zones, things like that. This needs to be taken care of. 
and we've been pushed aside, pushed aside, pushed aside and ignored. And now, two days ago, the Green Party has now issued a statement. Our local Green Party has now said, therefore, this as well. So we're pulling the elected officials, even the Green Party, behind us like a ball and chain. So traffic, this may be strange to you here in Portland, um, but parking is the issue that we're trying to deal with first and foremost, because people seem to believe, able-bodied people seem to believe that their right, their human right, their civil right to park in front of their door, even in a dense urban environment, is a God-given right that no one should take away from them. And so the parties have been reluctant, politicians have been reluctant to address this because they're afraid of losing votes. Well, we'll see if the Greens actually keep to their word when I get back. Um, this is another shot of my street. The delivery vehicle that I just showed you was parked kind of right up here on the sidewalk. So you can see we have these separated bike paths. I'll show you another photo in the next slide. This is a separated bike path that just ends here. So what happens in real life is people cross. You're not supposed to. Actually, you're allowed to cross here where there are no markings and then turn left. This is one of the few north-south corridors that we have in our neighborhood. Everyone rides illegally on the sidewalk. I do too on my way to work up here to the river where there's a separated bike path. But, you know, everyone sort of apologizes and on garbage day you can't get through. Very, very narrow sidewalks. So you can see there was planning 20 years ago, but it just stops. And we've had a petition. Our first application to do something about this intersection was two years ago, May 2016, almost two years ago. And we're still fighting elected officials. We're still fighting um, the transit authority, transportation authority to try to do something about this. The other thing is you've got more motorized traffic all the time. You've got a lot of people coming from out of town and you know sneaking through our neighborhood. So you've got people turning left here. You've got people turning left here. Lots and lots and lots of near misses. Um, I report these to the police. I get a license plate. I try to list the date and time. I didn't know that the police in Bremen don't actually follow up on anything unless there's injury involved, or of course, damage to property. That's even more important than injury, especially when a motor vehicle is damaged. So the police actually told my husband, sort of inefficiently under the table, that if this kind of thing happens to him, he needs to fall to the ground and roll around so that they will take it seriously. They're actually on our side. I mean, the police are some of the most pragmatic people that you talk to here as compared to the elected officials. And you can see we have four bus lines running through our neighborhood, two of which actually stop at the stops in our neighborhood. The rest are sort of long distance buses that just leave their diesel emissions. These are all diesel buses, double axle diesel buses in a residential neighborhood. You can see how close they're getting to the kids. It's about four feet away. And the kids would like to cross the street, but you can see them, you can see their body language, how they're shrinking back. So this is the same intersection. Um, we had a street party and had to document it in order to get funding to actually have the street blocked off. So there's very little traffic. Normally, this was a Sunday morning. Normally, there's a lot more traffic here. But you can see this is the other side of the intersection where the kids were standing. Here's the bike path, and it just ends. So our local SPD politician who lives right around the corner has said, oh, yes, we could make a box here for cyclists to wait in. Yeah, fine, when? He told me that a year and a half ago. And these bike lanes continue. We fought to have those stripes put back in. Um, there was infrastructure. 20 years ago, this was cutting edge, but it doesn't meet the needs of citizens today. On the other side of our neighborhood, the new town, the Neustadt, we're new because we're from the 1600s. Um, residents were tired of having bike paths and wheelchair ramps parked on. They were tired of cars speeding through this street. Here's this another north-south <laughs> axis called Landstrasse. Um, Ask the authorities over and over and over again, and we continue to receive the message, we don't have time, we don't have money. No, there's no money for that. No, there's no money for that. I question the truth of that, but residents then decided to take matters into their own hands. This unfortunately occurred when we were here in Portland visiting my family two years ago. Um, they painted the crossing blue. And you Portlanders know what painted intersections look like. Portland likes them. Portland wants them. They're Right, they're vibrant, they help reduce traffic flows, they make the asphalt a little bit more lively. Um, these gentlemen decided to pick a color that stood out and they felt that in doing so, motorists slowed down. People started obeying yielding laws, it made the street more interesting. Unfortunately, although the authorities were not willing to have time or money 
to do anything about enforcing existing traffic laws. We're talking about enforcing the vehicle code. We're not talking about any radical change to the vehicle code. So they're not enforcing parking laws. They're not enforcing speed or yielding laws. Although they weren't able to act to that extent, they were able to come in within a couple of days and remove the paint, scrape off a couple of layers of asphalt, and uh, Wolfgang and um, Walter, two of our activists in our neighborhood, had to pay for the removal of the paint, about 3,000 euros. Um, so it might seem like a failure, but the result was there was a public discussion about this. People know this blue intersection. We're actually taking this square as our logo for our neighborhood umbrella organization. So it did get some visibility. And evil, even the authorities, even the politicians are beginning to be aware that at least this street, at least this intersection is something they maybe might want to address in the future. Um, some other actions, some other issues about what we're up against with illegal parking. This is in a completely different neighborhood on the other side of the river, other side of the old town. A locksmith's vehicle repeatedly parks, blocking the guidelines for the blind, blocking the wheelchair ramps, blocking the tram stop. Neighbors have complained and complained and complained. This has also been going on for a couple of years. At the end, I'll show you our blog, Bremenize, where all of this is posted in English and in German. I translate the German. I write in English. They translate for me. So you can see all of these stories if you're interested in these cases of what we're up against. Um, so one of our activists ended up, the police told her she had to photograph it in four minute intervals over a 24 hour period and she did this. That's what these pictures are and still nothing has happened. So the police know about it, the authorities know about it, but individualized motorized vehicular traffic and especially the parking of it. And an automobile in Germany on average sits for 23 hours a day. So in German, the word is Fahrzeug, so a, a device that drives, and we call them Stehzeug, which is a device that just stands around. Other motorists have started parking there too. On our side of the river, we're using these lovely Spuckies, which is a nice way of saying a spit adhesive sticker. Um, lick them and stick them on the windshield. It's also illegal, but they're water soluble, so the motorist can scrape it off. The hope is while they're scraping it off, maybe they'll think about their behavior. If you find one of these on your windshield, you can actually go online, upload a picture of your vehicle, and the people who produce these will tell you what was wrong with the way you parked your vehicle. So there's a, an attempt to have some education here. Of course, it's against the law, but citizens are taking this into their own hands, and it seems to be having a little bit of an effect. However, I don't feel that this is a citizen's job to do parking enforcement. I'd like to get paid for it anyway. Um, clean air. I talked about Dieselgate. We were sold diesels. We were sold the diesel engine because it's German technology. It's better than any other technology. Well, we all know it's not, no, it's not just Volkswagen. It's not just Audi. It's not just Mercedes. It's not just BMW, it's also Siemens and Bosch. So I say diesel scandals because it's an ongoing thing and these companies will say, okay, that manager, he's the fall guy and they'll fire him. But they've had their corporate offices raided by the federal police. These people are criminals at the highest level. And unfortunately, transportation politics in Germany has been driven by this powerful lobby. You guys know how this is here in the States. Hopefully, this is an action of um, Deutsche Umwelt, Umwelthilfe, environmental NGO, you send them your address, you tell them what your neighborhood is like, they send you these little test tubes to measure NO2 and particulate emissions. We did this. This is my husband putting them up and he took them down yesterday. So we have them up for a month. We'll send them into them. They'll look and see what the particulate emission is in our street. So maybe NGOs message can get across to decision makers. Um, this is our street. This is the same street. So this sign right here is what we have fixed our test tubes to. And this is a normal summer day. We've got traffic backed up all the way to the next intersection. We did something cool. I said we had a street party. It was International Children's Day last summer. We, with much hard work on the behalf of one of my neighbor activists, we got our street blocked off for half a day. It cost 3,000 euros. Again, 3,000. I don't know why this is... <laughs> Just coincidence. But we had to pay to have the street blocked off. We got funding from some 
um, environmental organizations, and in fact, from the bus uh, authority, <laughs> who had to not run their buses on that day. They actually gave us a big fat donation and had a bus that kids could play in with sort of interactive programs. So you can see, when you see how much space this is, this is a thing I learned way back in the day in transportation politics, way back when I was doing critical mass, how much space a human being occupies versus how much space a vehicle occupies. That's, pri that's public space in Germany, as in the United States, as everywhere else in the world. Our tax money subsidizes this space that is privatized for individual private motor vehicles. And once you can see this picture, this is my son, He's five. He's slumming on the baby bike. He rides a big kid, big kid bike now. His name is Johan. He's so proud. I mean, he's got that whole street to himself. Some of the bigger kids are already running around. We were just starting to get set up. When it was full, it looked like this. We got permission on maybe one week's notice. And this is just one segment of our big street. Um, I, it was hard to know which pictures to share with you guys, but here you can see sort of grown-ups enjoying themselves. We had a band. Um, we had a cotton candy machine. We had coffee and cake. It's very classic German. You got to have your coffee and cake in the afternoon. Over here, we had a barbecue over here. My one neighbor stood there the whole time and manned the barbecue, donated sausages to the cause of paying back the 3000 that we had to pay. And people enjoyed this public space. And people said, wow, look at how big your street is. And people said, isn't that great that the kids can just play and have this entire big block if I go back to the last slide, you can start to see how big it is. How much space that is was for people, not for cars. So for me, as a social scientist, going into wanting to research this, I'm looking at the issue of fairness. And I'm looking at the issue of justice. And I'm looking at the issue of these are our public resources. These are our cities. How do we want them to look? I think that's pretty cool. Um, people actually had this concrete experience. And I feel like when you make the possible visible, when people see it and experience it and taste it and touch it, and people came to me for weeks afterwards and said, wasn't that great that you guys had that street party? Wow, my kids thought that was really cool. They had a slalom on scooters and bikes and everything else. There was football, there was face painting. I, I can't even name all the things we did because it was just packed full with everyone bringing in, bringing in their ideas. And so people could see it and they could experience the way I want to frame it is, how should our city look in the future? How should our shared public space look? And again, for me, as a critical theory social scientist, this is what I want to think about. This is what I want to raise consciousness about. Because I think consciousness raising is one of the most important aspects of the fight for sustainability. So what are our challenges and what do we have going for us? very intransparent political structures. A neighbor who's also a fellow American expat, um, friend of a friend, she ended up asking my friend, well, the air in my street is so bad. There's so much pollution. She lives right around the corner from us. So she's got the same problems with the diesel buses and with the commuter traffic going through our neighborhood. Who do I call? Well, my friend who she asked is from Uruguay, <laughs> she didn't really know either, but it's a question, who do I call? I still don't know, I've been doing this for two years now, concretely, in my neighborhood, in my street, I still don't know who's responsible for sustainable transportation in Bremen, because there isn't anybody. Bremen has a transportation plan, 2020, that's won prizes in international transportation planning, where there are, with citizen input, where there was bike club input, where there was pedestrian and wheelchair user advocacy input, what needs to happen? We, it's now 2018. We don't know when this is going to be implemented. Um, entrenched bureaucracies. This is a real problem. There's hierarchical language. There's a language barrier that does not permit average citizens or immigrants such as myself. I am not German, right? I speak German fluently, but I make mistakes and I have an accent. Oh, well, you know, you can't write correctly anyway. <laughs> Only a very small percentage of the population can. So there's a lot of hierarchical entrenched structures. Also party politics. I've heard Germany called a partyocracy. Um, if you get involved in a political party and you maybe, you know, sell baked goods for them and you maybe do their grunt work, in 20 years, maybe you can sit on the neighborhood council. You have to prove yourself and you have to get into this old boys, old girls network. 
of course, the automobile lobby. I'm watching the gun lobby story unfold here in the States and not to in any way belittle the deaths that are going on, but the way the NRA behaves and the way the automobile beha lobby behaves in Germany, there are parallels and they're harming people and they're harming the environment. We know that global warming is happening. Our city is at sea level, which could be an advantage for us. But people are not really aware of transportation as an environmental issue, and that's something that I really want to do, not just an environmental issue, but a social justice issue. Who breathes in dirty air? Who has a tram stop near their house? Who is served by public transportation? Who has to have noise pollution right by their homes? Obviously, immigrants, refugees, poorer people. Um, my professor in Berlin had a map showing the corridor of just emissions not even dealing with accidents, not even dealing with noise, but you know, the main thoroughfares are where poor people can afford to live, tending to be immigrants or children of immigrants, and they're the ones who have to breathe in the dirty air. There are advantages. Bremen people, Bremers, do use bikes, do use transit. It is traditionally a bike city, although the trips are not increasing. There is an awareness increasing. There's a, grassroots politics do not have a tradition as much in Germany as they do in the US, but this is happening, it's happening in Berlin, which I'm gonna look at later on when I do start doing research on this. So the media is also helping pretty much every day in the media, there's something about transportation. <laughs> environmentalism is part of German culture, even if it's a romanticized environmentalism, even if it's sometimes a colonialist or exclusionary environmentalism, even if it's not as deep green as I, as a political theorist would like it to be, it's still part of German culture. People try to waste less people are more conservationist. Um, climate change for a city at sea level. Our dikes are not high enough. That's got to be changed. So as the infrastructure is being repaired, as we go to the point of, you know, we have to fix stuff, dikes have to be raised anyway, why not make this a bike and pedestrian pathway? There are some plans, there is some resistance to that it's a really complicated, complicated issue. But I hope that I've been able to make this clear and I would love to hear any questions or discussion. Here are some of my sources and references, um, especially this site, Bremen Eyes, is where I'm an active participant, where you could read a couple of my articles. Oh, my font is not as clear as it should be here. BremenEyes.org. There's also Portland Eyes and Copenhagen Eyes, so in that tradition. Anybody have any questions? I'd love to hear, yeah. I, I have a question, you know, I was um, you know, considering that density, you know, is what you describe as the density of the where do you want to be What do you envision to where do you put those things? Excellent, that's a really good question. What I would like to see is I would like to see priority given to people who need it. So if you're a wheelchair user, you need to put your vehicle right in front of your home. You have priority. Um, I would like to see less private individual motorized vehicles because I think that most able-bodied people don't need them. We have a car. We have a diesel from Volkswagen. It sits around six days out of the week. And on the seventh day, my partner uses it to drive to his martial arts training that's a little farther away, or we take our, girl, our daughter to scouts because there's no other good way to get there. So transit, having more transit, having more investment in transit infrastructure, as in Portland, as in Los Angeles, we had more streetcars in my town. We had a streetcar that ended at my street. That's gone, that's been replaced with buses. Probably all of you who know a little bit about the history of transportation politics know what they did in Los Angeles to get rid of the streetcars. That's the same globally. That was not an accident. That was strategy implemented by automobile manufacturers, implemented by tire and oil companies. And the same thing happened in Germany as well. The streetcars were taken out. So I'd like to see more transit. I'd like to see more fairness. I'd like to see priority given to people who really do need an individualized motorized vehicle. I have a friend who's 72. She has her little car that she uses. She has fibromyalgia, so she can't get around that well. And I said, well, what if you had a tram in front of your apartment building? What if you had a free pass for transit as a senior citizen or as a disabled person? Stuff like that. So we're really bringing the issue of fairness and where sustainability becomes a deeper concept 
where sustainability isn't just sustainability, but we're talking about it being democratic, and we're talking about it being fair. And especially, I continue to insist on planning transportation for the weakest and most vulnerable members of society. So that's one answer. Can I ask yeah. you a follow-up on that? Yeah, sure. um, so how uh, much is um, car share available in Bremen? I know in some cities like Heidelberg, it's getting, or you know, actually all sorts of cities, it's a bit hard. How about Bremen? There's, to me, that's a huge solution. To that is a good problem. solution, exactly, exactly. And car sharing, you know, a fleet of electric vehicles, you can text it on your phone and, you know, go pick it up, whatever. I know people who use car share for us, it's been too expensive as working parents. There's one program. Only one? There's one. Yeah. Wow. That's... But our transit authority is uh, setting up as of this spring um, something like Uber, which is illegal in Germany for workers' rights purposes. Um, they decided that it was harmful to the people who were having to do it, but our transit authority is going to set up something like that. So my 72-year-old friend can walk out her door, text these folks, and they'll come and pick her up and take her to the shopping district. So there's also those kinds of options. But yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Car sharing, you know, if my street has, you've seen the pictures, if my street has, whatever, a thousand people living there in this dense urban environment, what if we had 50 cars and a van and a truck as a pool that we could use, or a moped, you know, and you don't have to own that thing, and you don't have to pay taxes on that thing, and people don't have to pay so much of their income for yeah, transportation. It's really expensive in Germany. It is. I mean, it's, it is, and we keep ours because it's paid off. There's another question over here? Yeah. One of the difficulties that we see in Portland in the kind of bicycle infrastructure conversation um, revolves around funding. You know, yeah. You know, Oftentimes, in the state's revenue for road improvements is just gas taxes and things like that. Yeah. So, that's kind of a constant argument you get when we talk about having more bicycle infrastructure is, oh, well, why should cars be in And uh, I just wonder if you could, because it looked at any sort of uh, you know, funding mechanisms or revenue mechanisms that can counter some of those arguments or that provide different ways to say, hey, listen, like, we're asking for this and we're providing a means to do that. Don't just tell us yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, my initial reaction is if they did parking management, you know, and had parking permits, that that would be some revenue. Bremen is the smallest federal city in Germany and the most broke. Um, but parking would be one source of revenue. I think red light running and speeding, I think they could ticket people. They don't. And I think that might be a source of revenue as well. But it's also where do funds get prioritized? So we have a couple of big projects. I haven't included them in my in my presentation because they're not citizen projects. Um, but we have a couple of big projects that then get federal funding or European funding to have, for example, a model model bike quarter. But um, yeah, it's an issue. It's an issue. But I think there needs to be a bigger discussion. And again, for me as a social scientist, I look and see where do taxes go. And we like to have firefighters and police and schools. And we like to have infrastructure. And we need it. But maybe there could be some reallocation as well. I actually looked into zebra crossings. I've seen a lot of them here in Portland, especially today on the way here um, down Burnside. Lots and lots and lots of zebra crossings. And I called the city and I said, we'd like one in front of my daughter's school, because safe routes to school is an aspect I didn't really mention here, but is, it doesn't exist. The concept of safe routes to school doesn't exist. And they told me a zebra crossing would cost 60,000 euros just to put the paint on the street. So I had the idea, and I can't do all of this myself as a working mom who's also starting her dissertation, but I know someone who runs bike and skate races, and I had the idea of asking him to do like a benefit, like a fundraiser, you know, a kid skates X number of kilometers and raises X amount of money for a zebra crossing, and actually putting that in the media to publicly shame decision makers, to call attention to the fact that we want cities for people. So it's a good question. It's one that I don't think I can answer, but it's definitely one to keep in mind. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. So I have um, a couple of questions from online. Um, so John from online asks that um, you said that Bremen is um, a bike city, but it seems like there's a lot of resistance also. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how, what is the percentage of people that bike? How does it compare to cities like Portland, for example? I don't have that off the top of my head, unfortunately. That's something I wasn't able to prepare when putting this presentation together. Um, actually, my activists asked me to bring those statistics back about Portland so we could compare them. But um, a lot of people do bike. 
longer distances. Um, but it's that under three kilometer, under five kilometers, under three miles distance that's not increasing. But I don't have that off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Um, yes, it is a bike city. It was always traditionally a bike city, but this infrastructure is 20, 25 years old. So it's, there are no continuous, you have a premium bike route and then it just ends at a six lane street and you have to find your way across that street and then the route continues and these are sort of national bike routes. So that might be one way, maybe some other funding might be a way to do that, but I'm sorry, I can't pull that out of the top of my head right now. But I'm sure if you wanted to email me, I could find it online. <coughs> yeah. There's more questions online, so, uh, so uh, here's a question from Jonathan. Um, he's asking that uh, the semi-trucks that um, are on those bridges and the major roadways are likely bringing in uh, lots of goods. Do you have yes. uh, kind of proposal to prevent them from entering the city, but still ensuring that the city has the goods that are required? What are Excellent. I was lucky enough to get a trip of, uh, tour of our harbor recently. Um, Bremen also owns the city of Bremerhaven, which has an international <coughs> harbor. Um, third largest harbor in Europe, said my friend who works there, I don't know, maybe fourth. Um, after Rotterdam and Hamburg, he was claiming it's the third largest. But a lot of the, those goods are being transported by truck. And you can get more of that on rail. They're starting to do that. They're starting to expand the rail network. There used to be shipping. A lot of this happened on sort of flat river barges. Um, not being a transportation planner myself, I'm not quite sure of the logistics of that, but there's definitely room for improvement. And yes, absolutely, those trucks are, that's our artery. That's bringing goods to and from the logistics center, from the logistics center to the harbor, to and from the airport, to and from the town. That's the main artery through that part of town from one side of the river to, to another. So it's definitely something that needs to be done again on a comprehensive basis, on an integrated basis, so that the harbor, imports and exports, a lot of which are automobiles, um, but which are a lifeline of our city and do bring revenue to our city and to our state, need to be taken into account, absolutely. But again, there are many different ways of doing that. If not, I'm a more question. Okay. Okay. So uh, Therese asks, um, do you think that um, the, the fence that you showed on the bridge um, in the early part of your presentation, do you think that the true purpose of the bike fence is to stop homeless people from sleeping under the bridge or to reduce for meeting? Interesting question. I'd never thought about that before. I've been talking with my family about homeless people. You know, do we have homeless people in Bremen? Of course, we don't have as many. I think um, happened to hear somebody who was working with homeless in Bremen. Of a population of 600,000 in Bremen itself, we have maybe 650 homeless people. So um, I don't think people necessarily sleep under that bridge. I've been over that bridge night and day. It's not my main route, but I don't think that that's the issue, but perhaps graffiti. But I think it was a lot of these kinds of things occur. I mean, this is a really classic example of sort of policy and politics being diametrically opposed from reality. And this is a problem in Germany in general. This is a problem specifically of transportation politics. I think it's either ill will or just incompetence, but I'm not really sure. Uh, apparently, they're now talking about removing the fencing and putting a counter for bikes and pets. Yeah. So, can't admit they made a mistake, but maybe they'll take it away and make the bridge eight times lighter. So, um, Kelly asks from online, that uh, if you could redesign or re-envision the street outside of your house, what, it, what would it look like and what mode would be prioritized? Oh, good. I believe there did used to be a tram line there. Our house is from 1903. I'd like to see a tram with a swath of green as we have other in other places in Bremen. I'd like to see motorized transport. And so that tram possibly or some other electric bus replacing the diesel buses. Um, I'd like to see more green. There used to be trees on our street. There aren't anymore. They all died out with Dutch elm disease. So that was not something that policymakers did. Um, I'd like to see less parked cars. I'd like to just see it greener and slowed down and have noise reduced. And those, the noise and the emissions aspects are something where we feel we have a little bit more of an inroad with changing things because some environmental organizations are working on noise as well. That's just one, I've thought about it a lot and that's how I'd like to see it. Greener and slower and quieter. Yeah, question over here.
As far as I know, not yet. There's this kind of kind of Fakir's bend, the, the, the change to sustainable transportation um, happening all over the place, and we're starting to network. We activists are starting to network with each other. What I will eventually be looking at when I'm applying political science to this is what's happening with social movements in Bremen and Berlin. And in Berlin, you have much more of a problem with infrastructure than you do in Bremen. Um, wider streets, less bike lanes, less safe and separated bike lanes, and more casualties, unfortunately. There have been a lot of fatalities in Berlin, and they've actually just passed a bicycle law, Farad Gazette. I think it was actually officially approved, so when it will be implemented, that's another question. But they seem to be a little bit far ahead, and I, my impression seems to be, unfortunately, because people have lost their lives. People, cyclists have to be killed before change can take place. So it seems like Berlin is a little farther along, yet they have more to contend with than we do. But I can't think of any one city that's really cutting edge. They all have these similar problems, and I'm looking at Bremen and Berlin as kind of exemplary of either this incompetence on the, half, on the part of um, Bremen or a much more dangerous city, and a bigger city in the part of, on the part of Berlin. Um, priority laws there. What what is the legal what are the consequences if there is a collision between a cyclist and a vehicle? Oh good, yeah. I've I've had to figure that out myself as well. Um two vehicles meet at an intersection. The simple answer is two vehicles meet at an intersection. The person on the right has priority, has the right of way. So if you're a cyclist and you're on the left of the motorist and they hit you, you have to pay for the damages to their car. And this has happened, not to me, thankfully, but to friends of friends. Um, you know, you, you, you plow into the side of someone's car, you have injuries, but you're responsible for fixing their car. Um, I don't really understand why pedestrians don't have the right of way. I don't understand the logic behind it, but I think that there are historical reasons why they say freie Fahrt für freie Bürger, the, the free, free driving being able to drive as fast as you can, as much as you can, the biggest vehicle, this is, this is my right. This is my human and civil right to be able to drive freely with my automobile. And so one of the very first paragraphs in the vehicle code says something like, nothing should hinder the free flow of motorized traffic, including school children, including zebra crossings, <laughs> including bike bicyclists. And so we have a lot of scary and aggressive drivers and we have a lot of scary and aggressive situations happening. So for example, in Berlin, there's a campaign against automobile machos where women, especially women cyclists, are feeling like they're being sexually harassed just because they're a woman riding bike. And I tell you, I was a bike messenger in California 25 years ago when there were no women bike messengers. And I was riding around in spandex and I got all kinds of stuff happening to me back then. And that culture of, you know, bigger, faster, stronger, more, is very present in Germany. So that's part of the problem is also this mentality, also this consciousness of the automobile as the best, the fastest. I think there's a quote from Margaret Thatcher, completely different country, but she said, a man who finds himself in a bus over the age of 30 has, is clearly not gonna make anything of his life, is clearly a loser. And that sums up the attitude really well. You know, If you have an SUV, you're a real man. If you're on a bicyclist, you're worth hitting. If you're on a bike, you're worth hitting. It's, a, it's an extreme, it's an exaggeration, but that's part of the problem. So, um, really interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering um, where do you see kind of the intersection of you, your experience here now in Portland with um, lots of cities moving towards Vision Zero and um, you know, reducing traffic with technologies with the vision of having zero? Uh, right. How does that um, kind of uh, interact with your experience of what Germany is seeing in terms of what uh, their interactions with pedestrians versus uh, Well, I think again, as I've said here in kind of my summary, I think that there's an awareness of this. I think there's starting to become an awareness of what's not fair, of the fact that no one should die, no one should be injured on the road. You know, roads, vehicles, whatever mode you use, it's your tool to get from A to B. Um, when I talk about Vision Zero, I only hear about it from transportation nerds like myself. They only really know what Vision Zero is. We have a long way to go in raising consciousness, I think. But um, 
one of the things I'm looking at for my later research is critical discourse analysis. And we're looking at how we talk about transportation, how we talk about mobility, how we expect citizens to be faster and more and more and more mobile all the time. This is a nice way to wrap this up, actually, because uh, I seem almost out of time. The idea you can compare transport to the Olympics. The Olympics are always trying to break their own records. Athletes are always going faster, higher, more, 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 to the detriment of their physical bodies. And transportation is always, your commute is longer, more traffic, more expenses, more, 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 higher, higher, faster, faster, faster. The planet is finite. Our resources are finite, just like an Olympic athlete's physical abilities are finite, even though they're the best of the best. So getting back to that and raising awareness of this is sort of a hinge moment where we're starting to change the discourse, hopefully, and talk about our planet and talk about the use of resources and talk about the use of public space. It's a lot. <laughs> but I'm hoping I can contribute one small piece to it through my advocacy and then also later through my research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.